Okay, the, the title of this message is um, Believe in the Bible. Believe in the Bible. So if you believe in the Bible, you trust the Bible. And I think the way, um, actually there's a scripture that says, faith comes from hearing and hearing of the word of God. So every weekend when you come here on the Sabbath and you hear the Bible, our faith should get stronger and stronger. And the more we trust the Bible, and I believe we're going to say things in the relatively near future about prophecies of Daniel that prove the Bible is trustworthy. But all the little things we learn, we'll learn some things today, will help us know that we can trust the Bible. And, it, and as we do that, we can get stronger and our faith and God can work with us more. Now, there are a lot of uh, people, worldly people, who believe the Bible is full of contradictions. Um, the reason they believe that is because they want to believe it. They don't, I mean, they, they don't mind people going to church and going through rituals, but they don't want you to really, really believe, if you understand the difference. Um, they want all standards to be kind of just whatever is politically correct at the moment, and um, they don't like real, absolute, Biblical standards. I want to tell you a story, but this story is supposed to make a point here. Three mass bandits rob a jewelry store in one of the corner elbows of a mall. So when the detective gets there, he's got four witnesses who saw the crime. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there are some slight differences in their stories. So a reporter Asked the detective, he says, you know, this is really bad that these people don't all say the exact same thing. The detective says, no, that's not correct. It is good that their testimony varies a little. I mean, on the essentials, you want them to say basically the same thing. But if they're going to be independent witnesses, they, their testimony has to vary. Well, it's harder to attack the Old Testament now. The Dead Sea Scrolls is kind of... Actually, there are a bunch of Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know how many there were. Kind of puts a, a punctuation on the transmission of the Old Testament being unbelievably accurate. Uh, but critics say, well, the greatest weaknesses of the Bible are the four Gospels because they vary in their testimony. Um, but good eyewitnesses do not all say the exact same thing. If they all say the same thing, a good police detective would say they're being coached, maybe by the strongest personality. No, you didn't see that. You saw what I told you you saw. Or by a defense attorney or prosecution attorney that's trying to set up a bogus case. If you think that through, you'll see why that's probably true in many cases. Um, but the critics say... Actually, the critics are kind of dual. On one hand, they say the first three Gospels, they call them synoptic. They all see with one eye. They say too much of the same thing. But then a few pages later, they say, but we don't believe them because there are some differences. Like, which way is it? It's both. They criticize for both things, which doesn't make any logical sense. But one of their big criticisms is that there are differences um, in the Gospels. Now, we don't believe any of those contradict each other. But I'm, we're going to look at two of the differences. Each one you can get a discussion on. We'll, get, we'll look at two of them this morning. One is on what was written over the sign, you know, in front of the stake that Christ was crucified on. What was written on the sign? Let's, um, Luke 28, 38. An inscription also was written over, the, over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is king of the Jews. Okay. But John 19.20 tells us this. That many of the Jews, when it says Jews, they're all Jewish. Well, I guess one was a proselyte to Judaism. But basically everybody in that whole scenario is Jewish. It really means the Jewish religious leadership. Because I know the confusion. Well, Christ was Jewish. His apostles were Jewish. So what it's saying in John 19.20, it's saying the Jewish leadership is, um, <clears throat> read the title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. So in other words, everybody would see it. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. 
Therefore the chief priest and the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said he was the king of the Jews. See, they didn't want that because it showed he was a great king, the Messiah, and he is coming to rule this world in the fairly near future. Um, and of course, Pilate knew they, they were jealous of Christ, so he didn't buy it. He didn't change the thing. And I think that was what God wanted, of course. Matthew 27, 37, and they put over his head the accusation written against him, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. You notice one person asked the word Jesus in, which wasn't in the other one. Now, John 19, 19. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. By the way, all the testimonies are true, but it's a cumulative thing. When you add all three together, it's like you accumulate. Um, the sign read, this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. In other words, you're going to say, why didn't the first person, Matthew, mention Nazareth? Probably because they just assume we take it for granted. Everybody knows he's from Nazareth. They didn't think it was necessary to, to, to mention it. Um, and, well, anyway, one person didn't think it was probably necessary to say Jesus since he was obviously, the whole thing was about him. But the main message was he was king of the Jews. Uh, and that is an agreement. So it really, as I said, is not a contradiction. They just want to make it. Uh, another attack on the four Gospels. This is one that one scholar, he really gets all worked up over this one. Um, they said, well, exactly where was the rallying place where Christ told them to meet him after um, his resurrection? What was the rallying place? Was it Galilee or was it Jerusalem? It can't be both. So anyway, let's, let's look at the evidence and see um, the truth of the matter. Um, <clears throat> but they think they've got a real contradiction. They really don't, but they're trying hard. Okay, Matthew 26, 31. Matthew 26, 31. Now this is Jesus talking. It's got sometimes good to remember who's speaking. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, he's quoting scripture because Christ and his disciples fulfilled all kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. As a matter of fact, when you read a lot of David's comments, you wonder, did David realize he was writing down the thinking and the feelings and what would happen to the Messiah who was in his line of lineage? Just make, maybe God inspired that. Maybe David didn't even know why he was writing some of the things he said, like in the 22nd Psalm and some of these comments. But the main point is, <clears throat> verse 32, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. That's what Christ said. Now, Matthew 28, 5. Matthew 28, 5. But the angel, now this is the angel that spoke to the women when they saw the throne, I mean, the grave site was empty. Stone rolled back, nobody in there. What happened to him? The angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed, Notice this, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So now Christ said it in advance. An angel said it at the time. Um, <clears throat> another scripture, verse 28, 16. This adds another detail that wasn't in the other two verses. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. In other words, Somewhere in their previous discussion, Christ, it's probably a mountain they had met on before, Christ said, when I'm risen from the grave, meet me on, you know, uh, whatever you might call it, Pike's Peak Mountain. Now, the mountains in Galilee aren't super high, like, you know, like some of the great mountains in the world, but, but as a small mountain, they probably knew which mountain he meant, and he told them. <clears throat> Mark 14, 27. Then this is Jesus again. 
All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For what is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've been raised, go I will go before you to Galilee. So again, that's three or four references to meeting in Galilee. And by the way, we know he did meet them in Galilee. Actually, he cooked them a breakfast while they were fishing. And there are several discussions about what happened in Galilee. So that's pretty clearly in the Bible. Um, and then Mark 16, 6. But an angel said, do not be alarmed. But go tell the disciples that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said. So what's the problem? Luke says, uh, this will sound kind of confusing, because I know it will sound confusing when, when I say this, like the scholars say, well, Luke is, is uh, contradicting all the others. Because, and then he says, because Luke said, we'll read the scripture in a minute, uh, remain in Jerusalem until I give you power. Now, let me explain what is most logical to have happened. Sometimes, they, you know, the most logical thing is the most obvious thing. Normally, they weren't going to stay 50 days because that's what it would take from you know, the day he w was raised, they call it the wave sheep offering day, to, to a Pentecost, 50 days. They were going to wait 50 days locked in a little hall, rental room, afraid that the Pharisees would pounce on them. That's not what they normally would do anyway. Normally, when the days of unleavened bread are over, they would go back, well, it's down the mountain, back down to Galilee, where they're from, and then as the new holy day is approaching Pentecost, they come back up to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So that's what happened. And, and with that, all the statements make sense. I'm going to read... Um, Acts 1, 1 to 5, um, in the message translation. I like this translation of this verse better, though the others aren't bad. Dear the Theophilus, in the first volume, this is Acts 1, 1, of this book, I wrote to you on everything that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he said goodbye to the apostles, the ones he had chosen through the Holy Spirit and was taken up to heaven. After his death, he presented himself alive to them in many different settings over a 40 days. In other words, one, like there's even an example where they're all in a locked room, and suddenly Christ just appears. You know, he didn't unlock the door and come in, just appeared. There's another case, he actually ate food with them so they could see that he was really not a phantom, he was really alive, and then he just disappears. I mean, so all kinds of things were going on like that during that 40-day period, and face-to-face -face meetings. He talked to them about things concerning the kingdom of God as they met and ate meals together. He told them that they were on no account to leave Jerusalem, but must wait for what the Father promised, the promise you heard from me. John baptized them in water. You'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit and soon. So he told them to wait for this baptism by the Holy Spirit, a baptism of power. I think the difference between Luke and the others, Luke is focusing on Pentecost more than the others are. I mean, because in the, in the very next chapter of the same letter, he talks about what happened at Pentecost. So that's what he's focused on. It's not, like if you're at a crime scene, we discuss this on the podcast, and actually several people actually knew some real examples of this. Different people focus on different things in a crime scene, and if, as a witness, they would tell the detective the things that they focused on. Somebody else would not have either didn't see it or wouldn't have been prominent in their memory. So, um, so he was focusing on Pentecost. So what we think is a certain maybe a week and a half or so before Pentecost, they came back up to Jerusalem to get ready. But whatever the time period was, I don't believe they actually knew. The way it's written, this appears to be the case. They didn't know whether they would get the power before Pentecost, on Pentecost, or after Pentecost. They just didn't know for sure. So a logical thing to do would be just to um, wait, like Christ said, and see what happens. Because um, it's easy to, be, to misunderstand. And that's what the commentaries want to do, because they want to find a contradiction. 
It, remi it reminds me of this corny joke called pushing a car. As I, this is a man speaking. As I pull into a gas station, I noticed a woman trying to push her car toward the pump on the, on the curb near the station. And I always considered myself a gallant gentleman and a good Samaritan. So I parked and I joined her in pushing her car. And she said to me, what are you doing? And I told her I was trying to push her to the gas pump. And I said, well, what are you doing? She says, I'm stretching. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, actually, she said, I'm stretching before my jogging run. <laughs> But it's easy to misunderstand, and they want to misunderstand the Bible. And, it, and you, you know, if you're not careful, you can see two descriptions of the same event, and they're a little bit different. You think, oh, has the Bible contradicted itself? Actually, there are books like the Harmony of the Gospels, but others, they have not been able to make any accusation against the Bible stick. They tried, and every time, like at one time, they thought, writing didn't exist when Moses said it. And they found this Hammurabi metal big cylinder that they could date further back than Moses, and they're writing on it. Every time they think they got the Bible on something, they unearth something up, the Bible turned out to be right after all. And it's going to be right about a lot more things. We're going to discuss one of them, Daniel, in the near future. Um, <clears throat> and um, so I just wanted to emphasize all those things. Um, that happened, and they got the power. Now, I think if we want to become better Christians, we need to trust the Bible and let it build up our faith week by week and realize what they might call independent witnesses. They're independent because there was no witness tampering. I mean, they weren't forced to say anything they didn't want to say. Each one said what they wanted to say, and there were differences. Now, I will say this, John, see, the others are called synoptic because they agree on a lot of stuff, a whole lot of stuff, very similar. Because John's, at least that's, they believe, he's, his gospel was written many years later. Now, I realize the New Testament had not been canonized and circulated yet, but John probably at least knew a fair amount of what the other three had written when he got to writing his. So, as a good witness, he says, well, why don't I try to put a lot of, additional things that they didn't put in. So John is much different. And that, you know, they don't like that either. But, you know, they want independent witnesses, but then they, they find reasons to complain about everything. Uh, <clears throat> but we can trust all four Gospels. They give you kind of a cumulative picture. You get one from Matthew, a bit more from Luke, some from Mark, and, and then from John. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 6 and 7, Christ, I mean, Paul said, Christ spoke to 500 people in one setting. Isn't it logical that was on the mountain in Galilee? Since he had told all his disciples and followers before he died, and the angels told him that at the burial site, he didn't go before you into Galilee. Now, he did see some of them that very day. You know, Peter and John ran out to the grave. and You probably know the story. And, and, um, and they got to know that Christ had been resurrected. But probably everybody that was one of his disciples, or certainly the vast majority, could have easily seen him on a mountain. He could be on a little ledge, a little higher than the rest. That thin air could carry his voice to a bigger audience. They probably would have had a harder time doing that in Jerusalem, since you know the Pharisees were really scared, spitless of Christianity. They're out to get him, if you, if you want to know what I mean by that. So it is most likely the mountain in Galilee is where the 500 heard Christ all at one time. Now I want to tell a story about a crown prince. We're still somewhat in the same subject. But because one of the messages of the gospel has to do gospels have to do with Christ himself. And I want to clarify something that might be confusing. Well here's the story. Say there's a crown prince and he his father is king and they got a big realm and you know all the dukes and, and all those uh, earls and other the marquees underneath them and he says you know I'm around all these royalties and people to suck up to me yeah because that's what they do to you know you're the crown prince but someday father I'm going to be the king I 
I want to be a little more compassionate to the little peasants that suffer so much. And he said, well, I'll have a peasant talk to you and tell you what it's like to be a peasant. I mean, I've talked to some already, and they tell me you know, what they're not afraid to say. They tell me what it's like to be a peasant. I want to know what it's really like to be a peasant by being a peasant. Of course, his dad says, that's really dangerous. Are you, you know, a lot of peasants starve. Are you? I'm willing to take the risk. He says, I'm going to go in disguise, but I'll go into the realm next to ours. Nobody will know me by face, and I'll just be a regular peasant for three years, live with the peasants, see what it's really like to suffer like the peasants suffer. And then when I come back, I'll be a greater king. <laughs> His dad said, you don't need to do all that. He said, yes, I do. I want to really be good. Now, his, probably, if this were a real story, actually, there are literature written like that, and then they go off and they meet a princess who was kicked out, from, and they great love story, you know, the prince and the princess, who are both out there in the, in, in the wilderness with the, anyway, with the paupers falling in love. But if... Also, in some of those stories, at least a few I've read, the king will tell a few of his best bodyguards, my son wants to go out there all by himself. I want you to shadow him, but don't tell him you're there unless he needs you. <laughs> and, he, and he makes a stir one, and he sends out several. At least one of them will keep an eye on him all the time, even if he doesn't know it. You know, in a way, that's what Jesus Christ did. I'm not saying it's as simple as the the king and the crown prince story, but in a way, isn't that, isn't that the gospel message? That Christ um, is, is both, here's the thing I emphasize to someone, Christ is both man and God. And we probably have a lot more to learn as years go on about the humanity of Christ and the divinity of Christ. So I'm not saying we know it all, because you know, no, you know, or, or even that we totally understand the Holy Spirit like God's powerful bodyguard and whatever, if you want to use that analogy. There's probably a lot more to learn about all those. But we need to say that we support the humanity and the divinity of Christ. And there's a theory called Gnosticism. And it means, in Greek, it means special secret knowledge. And that, they use that to undermine the church in the first century. And it appeals to vanity. I know special knowledge nobody else knows. And... They attack the humanity of Christ mostly. They said, well, if he's spirit and sin and physical stuff can't go together. So if he was from God, he had to just be floating off the ground. He didn't really suffer. He wasn't really human. And somehow they twisted that in such a way they end up preaching license against God's laws. I don't fully understand the logic of it. But there's plenty of historical records that really happen. They give you names and writings. They can quote all kinds of Gnostics in the 2nd and 3rd century. That, uh, and you'll see that in 1 John um, chapters 2, 4, and 5, where Paul, I mean, John warns about people that say Christ did not come in the flesh. Now, there are other Gnostic arguments. There's some clever side arguments and those kind of things. Rather than get into all of them, I just want to um, explain why we believe God is both human with all the weaknesses and fears that go with humanity and divine. And obviously we probably will understand it better as years go on. I'm going to quote Philippians 2. I know this is not one of the four Gospels. I'll get to those next. But I just like the way Paul put this. Now, Paul put it in, as an example that we should give selfless service, like the crown prince, at least theoretically, in this story, want to serve the people by really understanding their suffering. Uh, Philippians 2, 3. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for your own interest, but also the interests of others. Now, of course, that counters human nature. That's the opposite of what we want to do. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Now, notice this. Who being in the form of God, in other words, you know, God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, it wasn't, he wasn't saying the wrong thing to say he and the Father were equal. They both were God. But, 
but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, you know, like the lowest of the peasants, coming in the likeness of men. When you read that, we, we need to think about what it means to be God. God is so... Actually, as they learn more about the universe, and you realize God made and controlled all that, as big as Earth is, Earth is just a speck on a speck compared to some of the things in the cosmos. They actually have a black hole as big as our entire galaxy. And that's huge. So much energy, it actually sucks up sound. I don't know how they proved that. But supposedly they proved it. It's like God controls all of that. And um, I mean, the Earth is pretty big itself. Um, in other words, man is nothing. Like, you know what David said when he looked into the stars and he saw how great they were? He says, What is man that you're mindful of him? And David didn't even know the half of it. It's even more. So giving up that to become a man is quite a sacrifice. And God letting him do it is also a sacrifice. Now let's get to the Gospels. John 8, 42. Jesus said to them, uh, this is, uh, he's talking to the religious leaders, John 8, 42. If, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. That's why I say God the Father was part of it. Now, of course, the religious leaders were talking about how good they were, and they didn't like Christ. And he was just saying, if you really knew God, you accept me. Which, of course, but that also proves that Jesus knew who he was and what he was. You know, he didn't just come in the flesh as a good man trying to do a good thing. He had the mind, if you want, the mind, the heart and soul of God. Maybe he no longer had the power. He gave up the power. But he was, I think he gave up the power. I won't say I know every, all the ins and outs of how the spirit world puts power in reserve, but maybe it was put in reserve. But whatever, however God did it, he gave up the power, became a human being. Now, you're going to say, well, how did he calm the storm? Probably what he did, I'm giving my opinion is, the Holy Spirit, he knew the Holy Spirit was there to, to serve him when he needed it. He probably said, storm, be quiet, knowing the Holy Spirit would immediately affect all the forces of nature, the wind, the ocean. There's actually, actually for an ocean to, or even a lake to go from storm to quiet immediately, you have to do a whole lot of concentric uh, forces of nature have to be stopped. It takes a lot of power to do that. If you just, like if you were sloshing something in the bathtub and you wanted to stop and be calm instantly, I don't think you could do it. I don't think we have the power to do it, but the Holy Spirit does. And he knew the Holy Spirit would back him up. Um, like when he told the, this demon said to him, <clears throat> have you come to lock me up before the time? <clears throat> well, what, probably what the demon feared is, see, they can see the spirit world, we can't. There probably were some powerful angels and the Holy Spirit near Christ. And the demon probably figured, if Christ tells them to take me, you know, to the bottomless pit and lock me up now, that's where I'm going to go. That's why they were afraid of him. It wasn't so much that he was still God in the sense that he had, you know, how God glows with power. So much power that he had to have a special cloud between him and Moses, or Moses would have been burned to a crisp. But he still had the mind and heart of God. And he was backed up, I call it by the bodyguards, the Holy Spirit and powerful angels. But he really was a man, but he really was God. Because remember he said, I, he knew where he'd come from, the Father. And then verse 55 to 59 is really a very interesting encounter. 8, John 8, 55. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. In other words, he said, look, I talk, you know, the father that you admire so much, Abraham, I talked to Abraham, he was happy to see me. You know, Abraham walked and talked with God. I assume that was God, and the, God turned, toned down his power so they could see him but deal with him. But... As a friend of God. Well, you know, the Pharisees were stunned when he said that. And they said to him, you're not even 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, 
I am. Now that word I am in all caps, you'll find that in Exodus 3, when Moses asked God the first time he talked to him, what is your name? And he said, I am. Now we can maybe look at that. I like the way they did in the Ten Commandments. They did that pretty well. Maybe you could, we could substitute English words like eternal, ever-living, uh, prime God, I don't know, some other, but that, I mean, he exists because he exists. He never had a start, will never have an ending. Um, the eternal God. Um, and then they took up st stones to throw at him. In other words, they realized that he was saying he was God. I mean, they understood him. I mean, these guys knew Hebrew a lot better than any of us do. They knew he was saying he was God. Now, obviously, God did not allow them to stone him because he was being protected by the Holy Spirit, and so he would always escape when he wanted to, or God wanted him to. Um, he is the eternal God. And that's Christ himself saying, I talk to Abraham. So the one in that human body that was gestated in Mary was Jesus Christ. Now, people will argue this. Well, if he was a human being, what was he like as a baby and an infant and a little kid? And maybe we don't have to know that. All we know is that when he reached the age of, for the Jewish people, maturity, the 12, 13 age where they do the bar mitzvah, by the way, you know, they think they have proven that uh, human beings reach their full mental capacity by age 13. That you can, you can deceive smaller kids a lot easier than older kids because they don't know how to fully do tricky logic. That's, and that's probably true. So you could maybe argue God didn't give him full consciousness of his past as God until he was 12 or 13. But yeah, who knows? You know, really, and it doesn't really matter, does it? The details of how God did it, do they really matter? If, if we needed to know, God would have told us. Um, <clears throat> so the point is, now I want to read this next scripture to show you that he was human. Because this is, when you read this scripture in context, uh, like John 8 proved that he was God and remembered and knew that he was God. And Luke twenty-two forty-one 41 shows that he was very human and he had fears, the kind of fears that you would expect. Um, <clears throat> Luke twenty-two forty-one, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. That is the uh, crucifixion. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him, strengthening him. Why did he need strengthening? Because he was frightened. Uh, by the way, um, when you go to a place like Vietnam, at least I think this is what, at least in my case, what most of us feared the most was becoming a POW. The communists are known for their cruelty and torture. Our media doesn't tell you that, but they really were. And often they would do things, I guess probably other bad dicks did it too, they might bring you into a basement and tie you to a chair in a very exposed way uh, and, they, and give you a bunch of threats. And then walk off for maybe an hour or two while you hear other men being tortured. They want you to stew in your own fear. I, you got to think about that for a minute. Then they start working on you. That the fear of being tortured can be just as bad or worse than the torture. You just got to think about it. Well, if Christ was fully human, the crucifixion is a horrible way to die. It was designed, or borrowed, whatever, by the Roman Empire as a way to terrorize the public. If you saw somebody being crucified for, let's say, um, rebelling against Caesar or a couple other laws that they could crucify you for, you would think long and hard about doing it, wouldn't you? And, and actually, I can add some gruesome descriptions, but I won't bother with it. It was a terrible way to die. And Christ... I'm not saying he what he knew it was coming, but he still needed strengthening to face that. Doesn't that prove to you that he was human? And I'm not saying he wasn't better than us. I, of course he was. Um, but being human, he had fears. So Christ was fully human and fully God. Maybe he, devo he divested himself of some of his godly powers to become human. 
And he got him back as soon as he was resurrected. But he was still God. And that was a tremendous sacrifice he and the Father made for us unworthy human beings. And that's what you get from the Gospels. And even if you find some minor differences about who was the first to arrive or the first, I think the, 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 two, the women came in two waves and, and, and different ones describe who was first, who saw what first. It, you have to just, or cumulative, don't let it throw you off. If you read some article about, oh, the Gospels, they'll pick a couple other minor things, they say something different. They're saying different things just means it actually proves the Bible to be true. If all four witnesses said exactly the same thing, you know what the scholars would say? Witness tampering. It's not honest. Somebody told them they had to copy each other. It's not natural. And by the way, they didn't have cell phone cameras so they could all videotape and look at their videos. And actually, they didn't have writing tablets in those days. Even pencils. You know, pencils didn't come along for like 15 centuries. Pencil, anyway, they didn't have all that stuff. They had to be memory only. Um, <clears throat> but believe in Jesus. He's inspired the Bible. And as, as we do that, we'll get stronger and stronger each Sabbath day. Come here and hear the Bible being read and preached. <laughs>